Good afternoon, everyone. I've got the woman to my right who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persa Kelly. To her right, another familiar face, the state's epidemiologist, Dr. Christina Tan. Great to have you both with us. To my left, the guy who needs no introduction, Superintendent of the State Police, Colonel Pat Callahan. We get Paramel Garg, Chief Counsel, and a cast of thousands. Before we get to the numbers, a couple of quick updates, if we could. First, we are awaiting, Judy, I think today's meeting of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices and then the CDC's likely final decision on Pfizer's emergency use authorization for its vaccine in adolescents ages 12 to 15. This, should this be approved, every New Jersey resident within this age group will be eligible to receive Pfizer's vaccine wherever it is being administered. As we noted on Monday, this will be a big step forward for public health and in particular for the health of our school communities. And given that many vaccine sites across the state from our mega sites to our to local pharmacies are accepting folks for no appointment walk up vaccinations, we can quickly expand the number of those being vaccinated against COVID. We also have noted time and again that even though our youngest residents have among the lowest rates of hospitalizations and deaths, they have had among the greatest rates of transmission. So we encourage all parents to talk now with their adolescent children about getting vaccinated and when the CDC approval is given to go out and to do so. This will be a big step that will allow for students and educators to feel more confident in being in their classrooms for the remainder of this year. And it will set us up for every school to be fully back for in-person instruction in September. It will also be a big part of the overall picture for reopening more fully and more quickly. To that end, as a reminder, one week from today, May 19th, we will be making our most aggressive reopening play as many of the capacity and gathering restrictions that have been in place for the past year will be lifted and replaced with requirements for social distancing. Our business community and especially our restaurants have been preparing for this since we announced these plans nine days ago. And since all the current metrics are continuing to point in the right direction, today I will be signing an executive order that will effectuate all of the steps outlined for next Wednesday, May 19th. With that, let's turn our attention to the current numbers. We'll start with the latest from our vaccination efforts as of this morning. The total of those who are now fully vaccinated is 3,701,759. You can see the breakdown between those vaccinated in state and out of state. Um, the single most important thing I can urge is to keep this number climbing is that if you haven't yet gotten your first dose to go do so, and in most places you can just walk in without an appointment. And if you have received your first dose, go back and get your second shot when you are supposed to. Make sure that you are fully vaccinated. This is a key for our overall recovery. Today, we're also moving into a new phase of our door-to-door -door canvassing campaign. Today, we kicked off an $8 million effort to put even more boots on the ground in the communities where we need more people to go out and get vaccinated. This is in addition to the hundreds of incredible local volunteers already working hard in their neighborhoods. We will leave no stone unturned to ensure as many New Jerseyans as possible are vaccinated as quickly as possible. And I want to give a particular shout out to Mayor, Newark Mayor Roz Baraka, who I saw yesterday, and his team, who are today opening walk-up vaccination sites in every ward across the city. These sites are open to all Newarkers age 18 and older. We know our community-based efforts are among our most successful in reaching those who may not otherwise get vaccinated, and we are grateful to Mayor Baraka's leadership and for his continued partnership. Continuing with numbers, reporting an additional 1,167 combined PCR presumed positive antigen tests. Calculated over a seven-day trailing average, the rate of transmission is now exactly at one, and as we have mentioned several times now, there are a couple of reasons why we're seeing uh, we saw that little increase. The first is that our drop in added cases was so rapid and significant that fluctuations will have an outsized effect on RT. And if you'll remember, it was one week ago that the, the department cleared out roughly 1,700 previously unreported antigen tests, and those are all also impacting our current number. 
I think, Judy, your expectation, I don't want to put words in your mouth, is that that'll settle into maybe 0.6 to 0.8 as a relatively consistent range over the next period of time, and God willing, it stays there. Um, we, I think on Monday, Mahan, can we show these graphs over the, from March 4th of 2020 at some point? We haven't shown those in a while, but you, know, you look at RT, we forget that it was over five uh, in March of last year. Uh, and uh, 5.31 or 5.37, which is extraordinary. The positivity rate, again, would love to show you this over the long haul. For Saturday, 16,596 PCR tests was 4.7%. This is a good sign because it's a weekend. Uh, and as, you, as we've said many times for a long while, given our outsized results, uh, seeing the weekend numbers drop below 5% is a strong sign that we're continuing to head in the right direction. You may recall the past number of weekdays had three handles on them. To see this below 5% is a nice, uh, a nice data point as well. Our hospitals continue uh, to go in the right direction. 1,041 is the total census, 944 of whom were confirmed positive. The ICU count is 247, ventilators in use 162. A total of 139 live patients were discharged yesterday, uh, 99 went in and not yet confirmed, but the hospitals reported 23 deaths. However, this is confirmed and we are with a heavy heart reporting 33 newly confirmed COVID-19 related deaths. The number of probable deaths has also been updated today as we do on Wednesdays to 2,648. That's an increase of eight since last week. If you combine the confirmed and probables, the death toll is a staggering 25,882. And as we always do, let's take a couple of minutes to remember and honor the lives of three more uh, who we have recently lost. Let's start in Rivervale in Bergen County, which was home for the past 57 years to the guy on the left, John LaMarca, a native of Cliffside Park. He was 90 years old at his passing. John was a standout student athlete at Cliffside Park High School, earning a full basketball scholarship to play and study at St. John's University. During the Korean conflict, John would proudly serve our nation, earning the Korean Service Medal and a UN Service Medal to complement his two bronze stars. After returning home, he earned a master's degree in education at Montclair State College in those days and embarked on a career as an educator and counselor at Fort Lee High School. He was just as active outside the school community with the Elks Club, the American Legion, and the Knights of Columbus, in addition to being a regular parishioner of Our Lady of Mercy Church in Rivervale. John leaves behind his wife, that woman, George Ann, and his children, John, Mary, Virginia, and George, and their spouses, and his seven grandchildren, Jesse, Kelly, Gianna, Ryan, Christopher, Dane, and Christy, along with numerous nieces and nephews. I had the great honor to speak with both his wife, George Ann, and his daughter, Mary, on Monday. George Ann was also Judy COVID positive, but did not get terribly sick, thank God. And she reminded me, John had, or she told me rather, John had, his, you remember he was 90 when he died. He had his first, not only his first heart attack at the age of 30. So she said, I don't want to put words in her mouth, but this is incredibly hard, obviously, uh, but he got 60 more years after that first heart attack. Uh, God love him. We thank John for his service to our nation, to the students in Fort Lee that he helped along the way, uh, for being a great Jersey guy. May God bless him, watch over him, his memory, and his family. Next up, we're going to come to Mercer County to remember the woman in the middle there, Joan Tinsman. Born in Princeton and a resident of Hopewell, she spent every one of her 85 years between those two communities. Joan was also, uh, as John was, uh, Joan was also a standout athlete. As a young woman, she won over her future husband, Harry, in part because of her abilities, abilities as hit watcher play the hot corner, third base, for her Princeton softball team, where she also had a 400 batting average, so the Ted Williams of Princeton in those days. Throughout her life, Joan would be a Princeton University sports booster, attending many basketball games at Jadwin Gym. 
but she was even more dedicated to her family, to her 65 years of marriage, to her beloved Harry and to the family they raised. She was strong but emanated kindness to everyone she encountered. She loved a good book or a competitive game of Uno. And when her sons were younger, she'd cook them and their friends breakfast during hunting season, making sure they set out well fed. Joan now leaves behind her Harry, and, the, and Harry is to our left and her right. Please keep him in your prayers. He said some health issues. She leaves as well her three sons, Harry Jr., Jeffrey, and Russell, and her daughters, Kimber Kimberly and Melissa. I had the great honor of speaking with Melissa on Monday. She also leaves their families, which include her grandchildren, Jeffrey Jr., Jacqueline, Kyle, Kelly, Mackenzie, and Layla, and great-grandchildren, Emma and Leo. She's also survived by four brothers. May God bless and watch over Joan and her family. She was a Jersey original. And finally today, we remember Jean Gordon. Born in Belleville, she grew up in West Orange and lived in Flanders in Morris County. Jean was just 59 years old. Jean leaves her husband of 27 years, Anthony, with whom I had the great honor of speaking on Monday, and her son, Anthony Jr., and by the way, both dad and son were also COVID positive, and she was to each of them a rock. She's also survived by her stepfather, Thomas, her brothers, Robert and Joseph, and sisters, Lisa, Teresa, and Bridget, and their spouses, and many nieces and nephews. Like so many, Jean strived to make her home a place where everyone was welcome and everyone felt like family, and from speaking to family and friends, you'd quickly learn that she succeeded. Anthony, her husband, that's her son Anthony with her, but Anthony, her husband, had reached out to my office to ask for our prayers while Jean was battling COVID. And by the way, he reminded me on Monday that Jean was also a cancer survivor. We are heartbroken, literally, to have to honor her memory today, but we hope that God blesses her memory and her family. She will indeed be missed. So we've been honoring the lives of those lost for more than a year now. They are just a sampling from among the nearly 26,000 we have lost, but each story deserves to be told and each life deserves to be honored. We know that even as many of the metrics we are tracking continue to improve, there will still be lives lost and we will continue to remember them because they are all family. And for the past 14 months, we've rallied to protect our family, not just from the pandemic, but from the other impacts it has had, including food insecurity for many families. <clears throat> and that's a good segue to say that's why we need to support and shout out organizations like this, the Coalition for Food and Health Equity, run by that woman, Dr. Lija Carter, which focuses on providing support, supports that bridge the twin goals of neighborhood revitalization on the one hand and better health through food equity on the other. Most of Coalition Equity's clients live in marginalized communities and food deserts in both Hudson counties and Newark's urban landscape. Through its multitude of programs, Coalition Equity aims to reach outside a neighborhood's rigid structural limitations, <clears throat> excuse me, to demonstrate how communities can create sustainable long-term models for addressing hunger and nutritional health. Through the New Jersey Economic Development Authority's Sustain and Serve New Jersey program, and by the way, I was very happy to announce another $10 million toward that on Friday, Coalition Equity has found a great partner in helping to provide access to fresh, healthy, and nutritious foods for the families they serve. This partnership is more than tackling hunger and supporting local restaurants, although it is that. It's allowed Coalition Equity to highlight the innovative, innovative meal solutions and the power of food to reinforce dignity and respect. <clears throat> it's really a simple premise that guides coalition equity. No person should be limited when it comes to access to healthy, hearty meals. I caught up with Lija on Monday, had a great conversation. I thanked her and the team at Coalition Equity for their great work tackling hunger and food insecurity in our state's densest, most urbanized and most diverse counties. We are proud to be their partner. Check them out, by the way, coalitionequity.org, coalitionequity.org. And as a general matter, partnership and co cooperation 
or what will see us through. <clears throat> Whether it's partnerships with county and local officials to support their vaccine efforts, partnerships with our small businesses our, and small business community to provide the financial supports they need, partnerships with our schools to get our students and educators back into the classroom, or partnerships with the millions of you to get vaccinated and defeat this virus. It's taken all of us together to come this far, and together we are going to finish the job. On that note, please help me welcome the woman who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. Well, as the Governor mentioned, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices is likely uh, to update its recommendation for who should receive the Pfizer vaccine. We expect that they will recommend the use of the Pfizer vaccine in adolescents ages 12 to 15. And when that decision comes, this population will be immediately eligible for vaccination. As with all vaccinations, consent from a parent or guardian will be required. You know, these press conferences give me an opportunity to increase awareness, information, and education. And I feel that it's one of my most important roles as a commissioner. So today, I want to send a message to parents of children who will be eligible to be vaccinated, perhaps as soon as tomorrow. New Jersey is moving in the right direction with case numbers declining, and having this age group vaccinated will help us fight this virus even further. Adolescents want to get back to seeing their friends. They want to get back to going on trips. And the best way to do that safely is to get vaccinated. The Pfizer vaccine is safe. Parents who have questions should talk to their pediatricians or their health care providers. It's important for adolescents to get vaccinated because we have seen in rare cases children can get very ill with this virus. As we have seen in our state, 116 children were diagnosed with multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, and all of these children required hospitalization. MISC is a rare condition where different parts of the body can become inflamed, including the heart, lungs, kidney, brain, skin, eyes, or the gastrointestinal organs. Many children with MISC had the virus that causes COVID-19 or had been around someone with COVID-19. It can be a serious, even deadly syndrome, but most children who were diagnosed with this condition have gotten better with medical care. Thankfully, in New Jersey, there have, there have not been any deaths associated with this syndrome. Among COVID-19 deaths in the state, there have been seven deaths among those under 18. While many do not think this virus can be serious for children, the data shows that it can be. We encourage parents to take their children to get vaccinated to protect their health. With cases in New Jersey on the decline, vaccinations increasing, and a reduction in outbreaks at long-term care facilities, the department is taking steps to lessen restrictions for vaccinated residents and expand services to residents in these facilities. Today, the department is releasing an updated directive to long-term care facilities to accommodate more visitation, group activities, and the provision of services for residents after vaccination, which aligns with updated guidance from the CDC and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. During visitation, if both the visitor and resident are fully vaccinated, residents and their visitors may choose to have close contact including touching or hugging and removing their face masks if they are alone in the resident's room. Fully vaccinated residents may choose to have close contact, including touch touching with their unvaccinated visitor. However, they both must wear a well-fitting face mask. The department has also updated guidance on communal activities and dining for residents who are fully vaccinated. If all residents participating in the group activity or communal dining are fully vaccinated, they can participate without physical distancing and without wearing a mask during the activity. The department has required routine testing of residents and staff to prevent COVID-19 from entering and spreading within these facilities. 
Under this updated directive, fully vaccinated staff do not have to be routinely tested. However, unvaccinated staff must still be tested based on the regional Cali score. If it is high, twice a week. If it is moderate or low, testing will still be required once a week. However, facilities, given their own particular circumstances, may elect to continue routine testing of staff. Staff will need to undergo testing if there is an outbreak investigation at the facility or if they are experiencing any COVID-19 symptoms. The department urges staff and residents to get vaccinated by taking advantage of the current pharmacy partnerships that we have in place that deliver vaccines to nursing homes. <clears throat> Non-essential personnel such as barbers and hairstylists are permitted to enter if they are screened by the facility and if the facility has protocol for services to be delivered safely, which must include infection prevention and control precautions, physical distancing, hand hygiene cleaning between clients, and use of well-fitting face masks. Staff testing requirements apply to these individuals as well. I also now want to share some good news. CDC has released updated life expectancy, and New Jersey has one of the highest life expectancies in the nation, 79.8 years as of 2018. Now, this may have changed during the pandemic, but according to the new data released by the CDC, New Jersey ranks 10th in the United States. However, it is noted there are disparities within the state. But when you look at the county and community levels, disparities become apparent. Wealthy communities, Hunterdon, and Bergen, and Somerset ranked in the top three with life expectancies of 84, 83.3 years and 82.6 years, respectively. In comparison, Cumberland and Salem counties had life expectancies of slightly more than 75 years. This reflects that health in, is influenced by many factors, education attainment and access to care. So we have more work to do to bridge these gaps across the state. Moving on to my daily report, uh, our hospitals reported 1,041 hospitalizations. Uh, these numbers are down uh, again today. There are 3,855 reports of CDC variants of concern. Uh, 3,566 of these variants are the UK B117. Additionally, we have 123 reports of the Brazilian variant, 11 reports of the South African, and 155 reports of the California variants. Thankfully, there are no new reports of multi-system inflammatory sy syndrome in children. Uh, as stated, we currently have 116 cases cumulatively. Uh, the state veterans' homes, there's no new cases among their residents, and at the state psychiatric hospitals, no new cases among their patients. The percent positivity as of May 8th in the state is 4.7%. The northern part of the state is 4.99, the central part of the state 4.05, and the southern part of the state 4.93. So that concludes my daily report. Please continue to stay safe, mask up, physically distance, stay home when you're sick, get tested, and to everyone, let's get vaccinated, New Jersey. Thank you. Judy, thank you. <coughs> <coughs> Pardon me, getting choked up over your report here. Um, four quick things. One is, notwithstanding some folks who are on record saying otherwise, these press conferences happen for a reason, and that is to deliver as best we can and as accurately as we can the information that we think is relevant for folks uh, to hear, to hopefully keep them safe, healthy, and alive. Um, so this is not some... Uh, other reason other than that period secondly let's repeat something we've said a lot lately if you if you're a resident in a long-term care facility or you've got a family member in a long-term care facility go to management and ask them two questions what percentage of staff are vaccinated and what's the plan to get that number to the right levels and by the way the staff I don't want to be vilifying the staff the staff in these places have done 
heroic Lord's work, but the fact of the matter is that is a weakness right now in our long-term care. Thirdly, I've only got uh, four points here. Uh, Thirdly, your comment about, I, I read the same data you did, Judy, about life expectancy by county. Just another reminder that equity runs through all of the health realities that we're dealing with, including the vaccination rollout, which overall has been extraordinarily successful, but is very much still a work in progress as it relates to equity, which is why Mayor Baraka's initiative, for instance, in each of the five wards um, in, in Newark is so important. And then, Tina, I'm going to put you on the spot. No new multi-system inflammatory syndrome cases for the past week. That's the first time, I think, in a quite some time we've had literally no new cases. Can we read anything into that, or is that, is that a trend, or is that just a, 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 a data coincidence? Well, you know, we saw the increases in MISC uh, during the times when we saw peaks in our cases overall. So certainly, um, you know, when you have more disease out there, there's more of a likelihood that the kids are going to get infected. And then, unfortunately, a small subset are susceptible to developing these consequences. So as long as we keep these case counts down, you know, I'm not saying that we're never going to see another case again, but it does align. That's the important point. It's correlated with whether or not we're rising or dropping. And right now, thank God we're dropping. So thank you for that. Judy, thank you for yours. Pat, again, haven't had a ton of compliance violations that we've heard lately. I think it continues to be the case. Thank you for the good weather, but you've got other weather uh, uh, sort of preparedness uh, to, uh, on your mind, I know. So thank you. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. Uh, to the Governor's point, no executive order violations were reported to the ROC since we last met. Um, and to the Governor's point about preparedness, it is actually, I uh, take this opportunity to announce it is Hurricane Preparedness Week. Um, and the pandemic has not stopped us from meeting with our federal, state, county, and local emergency management partners. Uh, Those relationships are phenomenal, including updating our hurricane decision support tool um, that we've updated for our 2021 hurricane season. Uh, As always, I know the Gov, usually we're at a a winter storm, but always directs people to ready.nj.gov where our survival guide has been updated as well as uh, how COVID-19 has impacted your your go bags and those kits, you know, those grab and go kits with regards to PPE, hand sanitizer, uh, and as always, our ready.nj.gov, our social media platforms will continue to um, keep an eye on hurricane season and, and COVID-19 hasn't uh, allowed us to just take our eye off of that preparedness ball either. So we're just, uh, as always, as a state that's uh, felt its impact from hurricanes, uh, we still have uh, a close eye on on that. Thanks, Governor. Yeah, it's another uh, reminder that life goes on, right? So Mother Nature doesn't decide just because we're going through a pandemic to take the winter off or the summer off in this case. Um, thank you for Pat. Thank you for that, uh, Pat, and the weather this week looks pretty good, so uh, we're in good shape. I think we'll be in the same mode that we've been in. Um, we'll be virtually with you in the next couple of days. Um, I think, Judy, I think we're together in somewhere up north on Friday, so hopefully we'll have some COVID numbers. It'll be late enough that we'll have some COVID numbers, and we'll be able to relay them to you, and we'll be virtual tomorrow and then over the weekend. I think we'll start over here. Dante's got the mic. Elise, how are you? Nice to see you. Good to see you as well. In regards to the Colonial Pipeline, at least three Pennsylvania terminals have run dry and lines are forming at some of New Jersey's. Have you had any dialogue with fellow governors on the supply situation? Are you considering rationing? Have there been any reports of gouging? And should motorists consider limiting their gasoline use in the short term? And then a question from Nikita, do you support a proposal by Representative Gottheimer and Senator Lagana to impose a sales tax for non-New Jersey residents on Hudson River crossings if New York imposes congestion, pri- congestion pricing? Thank you. Thank you. Good to, good to see you. Um, so g- gasoline uh, prices have crept up. Uh, maybe you could even say more than crept up in New Jersey. I think the average price is now something like 304 a gallon. Uh, and that's up. Um, it's, it's not clear that there is a direct impact of the Colonial Pipeline issues with either gas for your car or the other thing that's on our mind is jet fuel um, 
at Newark Liberty. We've been in touch with uh, the federal uh, team on this. Uh, I, one point of, I think, pride and important uh, data point is that Congressman Donald Payne is the chair of the subcommittee that oversees jurisdiction uh, for something like this in the Homeland Security side. So he's been very valuable in the, and, and continues to do a terrific job. There is some amount of human nature behavior. So I had two data points yesterday where this is real. And that one data point from Virginia where my daughter is in school and one from a, an acquaintance in North Carolina of the family of one of my sons. And they, they, legit, they have real supply reality shortages in those states. Um, and the long lines you see are because of, of a supply issue. We, and I'm knocking on wood here, um, outside a, a general challenge of getting drivers to drive fuel trucks, it's a lot like, like a lot of other employment challenges these days, there's a shortage there, but that's not specific to the pipeline. We don't, knock on wood, have a supply uh, issue as we speak. If this goes on a long time, that may well change. But you do have human nature, Elise, um, and I don't blame people for that. You saw early on in the pandemic, uh, people hoarding toilet paper. Anybody who has a memory of the 19s, was it 73, 74, Dave, uh, oil uh, embargoes and, and gas crises reflexively, right? You go out and you want to go out and, and uh, get gas and get ahead of the pack, as it were. So there's some amount of natural behavior like that. We're monitoring this very closely. We don't like seeing the prices go up for whatever reason. Uh, but at the moment, at least, we don't have a supply uh, issue. That could change if this is extant for a long period of time. Listen, I love the fact we've been fighting uh, for our, the, the rights of New Jersey commuters, and I love the fact that Josh Gottheimer and Joe Lagana, and I think uh, Chris Tully was, been, um, uh, was also a, a part of that. Um, you know, we've said right from the get-go, we want fair treatment, no double taxation, no um, uh, unexplainable anomalies where you've got the Lincoln and Holland tunnels included and the, the George Washington not included. Lisa Swain, I think, was also part of that. I want to give her a shout out. Uh, we want to be at the table. We want to make sure that we're not getting double taxed uh, or double tolled. Um, and, and, and frankly, if there's revenue that's generated, we want a piece of that in New Jersey because our, you know, that, that's, that would be part of the deal. We have enjoyed very good relations with New York forever and always, and I'm still optimistic that this lands in a, in a, in a good and fair place. But I love the fact that we're fighting it. I'm fighting it. I love the fact that Josh and, and uh, the, the, the team from the legislative district are standing up um, and, uh, and we're going to continue to do that to, in, until we get a, a resolution here that is fair. Um, uh, and I, I, I can't comment on a legal matter. Parama won't let me, but we're also uh, not uh, taking it lying down on wages that are taxed in New York, uh, which makes sense, I guess, if you're going into New York every day, but doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you're working from home in New Jersey. Uh, we're going to fight that one as well. Uh, so we'll continue on all fronts. Good to see you. Let's, let's come down and hit Matt, and then we'll go back up to Dustin and Alex. Hey, Matt. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, with the news that Pfizer vaccines will be available to children as young as 12, will the state require students of eligible age to be vaccinated before returning to school in the fall? Uh, if not, why? And beyond saying that everything is on the table, could you provide any more details about how the $8 million is being spent on vaccine hesitancy efforts? Uh, also, actually, just today, I heard from a reader who received a bill from Virtua for a vaccine that, that shot that they got at the state, one of the state's mega sites. Uh, what are folks' recourse if they get erroneously billed at a state site? Do they deal with the state, or do they have to fight it out with their insurer? And uh, finally, what's your reaction to the allegations that have come out of Baps Temple in Robbinsville? Okay, um, bear with me. So, this is. Given it's May, what, what is today? The 12th, I guess. We put out our guidance, Judy, in mid-June, as I recall, last year for school reopening the Department of Ed and Department of Health and all uh, relevant parties worked on. So accepting that, that we're still probably a month before, a good month before that we would do something equivalent this year. Um, I continue to be in the place that I've been. 
which is I hope that we get there of their own free will to get vaccinated as opposed to mandating it. I will say this, we were having a discussion earlier. Um, it's just a reality. I, I don't know how it will evidence itself, but Judy mentioned this in the context of long-term care staff. It's going to be a lot more convenient to be vaccinated and a lot more inconvenient to not be vaccinated. That's just going to be a fact over time. For instance, if you're vaccinated, you don't need to get tested uh, twice a week or whatever it might be. I think that's going to be a reality. I don't mean that just for kids, but we'll come, come back to you on that. I think we'd also like to come back to you on how the $8 million is going to be spent, because I don't want to give you a generalization. So, Mahan, maybe Monday latest, let's go through exactly what that looks like, if that's OK. Um, I'm going to be a little flippant. If you get a bill for a vaccine, my first piece of advice is don't pay it. Uh, recourse, Paramount, that, that shouldn't be happening. Uh, sh should they come to us? Where do, they, where do you want them to go? Yeah, I think it might depend on the specific situation. So we're happy to follow up with that individual directly. That should not be happening. Um, I think the, 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 the work, uh, the violations at the BAPS Temple are hor horrific unfathomable that if all of these allegations turn out to be true that this is happening in the year 2021 in New Jersey uh, the wages the living conditions the the false premises awful and by the way I've visited this is an extraordinary this will be their largest temple assuming it gets completed in the world uh, I have visited their I don't know what you call it the mother temple I guess in, in fact you were with me Matt in um, in India um, so, you know, with, this is nothing about disrespecting the religion or the houses of worship, but nobody, 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 nobody can live in the conditions that are being alleged here and being paid what they're being paid all on false premises. It's awful. Um, and I want to give Judy and your predecessor, Sharif El Nahal, a big shout out because uh, without getting into the details, there's been a big effort to make sure that uh, that the health, the literal health, including COVID exposure and otherwise, is being looked after by you and your team and Sharif and his team at University Hospital. Thank you for that. Dustin, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, just got a few questions on unemployment and this uh, apparent labor shortage we're going through. Um, President Biden said the federal labor, Depart labor department plans to work with states to ensure they have work search requirements for unemployment benefits. Can you clarify whether New Jersey does have requirements for job seekers to certify, or does your administration plan to put other requirements in place? If so, what details on that can you share? And if not, why not? Another impediment to people getting back to work has been a lack of childcare. Uh, when can people expect you to lift capacities at daycare facilities? Uh, same question for the one-stop labor department offices where people can get help in person for training and job help. And on the unemployment insurance fund, do you plan to use federal, uh, federal stimulus money to replenish that instead of leaving that on employers who are trying to rebound this year? Thanks. Thank you. Um, I, went to, I went to Rob Acero Angelo. He and I were back and forth this morning um, on this work search requirement, um, which a, a lot was made of when the president said that and, and Rob reminded me that each week, and I'm going to read the, the note I got from Rob, each week claimants certify that they have not refused suitable, uh, suitable work. That was never turned off. So if they are doing that, they are committing fraud. So that, that has been uh, in place and it will continue uh, to be in place. I think, Dustin, as, uh, and I'm glad you asked about child care because I think my answer is broadly where I was on Monday why is there a labor shortage? I mentioned to Elise's question that another category apparently are fuel truck, truck drivers. Um, my gut tells me and everything I've read since then is a combination of reasons. Uh, there's a one body that would blame all this on extended benefits. I think that may be in, in, partly um, to blame, but apparently when you look at lower wage states, where you would expect that impact to be more significant. In other words, the gap between the benefit received and the, the wage they could have earned if they were working, you would have expected to see anomalies in the, those labor markets which were different than higher wage states like ours, and apparently that was not true in the data from last week. So my gut tells me it might be part of it. 
Um, I, but I think a, a big part of it is probably childcare. Kids not entirely in school Monday through Friday, regular hours. People afraid, frankly, to go back into the water, as it were. Um, Judy, I've got no news on child care capacity, although we have put a ton of money into child care. In fact, we announced some of the money on Friday was child care for child care facilities. And my guess is as we review the eligibility and the parameters around the American Rescue Plan money, you'll see more of that. Um, I assume those capacities are you, you'll continue to review and and expand as we feel like we can do it safely and responsibly. I'm getting nods from my right. Um, the one-stop shops, I think, I think the, the basis upon which um, my interactions with the commissioner have been, if they can more efficiently and more quickly process claims by being in those locations, that will happen. Um, if they do not believe they can, then they will probably continue to be in the mode they're in, not forever and for always. This, this virus is clearly headed down right now. And at a certain point, I don't know when, we're all going to be back uh, largely to work in one form uh, or another, even beyond the folks that have had to be in their positions of work. Um, but that would be my guess in terms of the decision point for them. I don't have a good answer for you yet on the unemployment fund Dustin, because we're still reviewing. We got the preliminary um, guidance from U.S. Treasury. Paramount, I believe it's 150 pages. It is, a, it is a work in progress. There's actually a comment period, which is in the here and now, so we're digesting this, and we're ourselves going to go back with reactions to that, including things that are not included that we think should be included. So if you could bear with us on that one, I would appreciate it. Uh, but we will have an answer on that at some point. Thank you. Alex, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, for the commissioner, if Pfizer approves vaccination for 12 to 15 year olds, will those who are vaccinated be counted as part of the 70% goal that the state is working towards or will that be separate? Additionally, I wanted to ask you about the guidance for not people who are fully vaccinated not having to mask in indoor dining. Are you concerned that some restaurants will effectively set up vaccinated and not vaccinated sections to get more business and do you discourage them doing that? Governor, for you, why do you think there is vaccine hesitancy? Why do you think that people are reluctant to get the vaccine? Does anything have to do with your messaging? Was there anything about your message that you would change to try and get more people vaccinated? And also on the BAPS Temple, you had at least two campaign events there in 2017. Do you disavow their support? And will you return any campaign donations you received? And finally, how will the $40 million for undocumented workers, how will that fund be administered? And how will the determination be made if someone deserves money from that or not? Got it. So one of the things that Judy addressed this yesterday, we want to always present the data as best and accurately as we can. And we, we now again, I'm looking at 7.754 million shots in arms. I think we're number seven in the nation both in first shots as well as using supply that we get, and there's no state above us that's remotely as big as we are. So as a general matter, um, uh, it, it's been a, a, a big, overwhelming, very complex, but so far, knock on wood, successful program. Where we're not satisfied is the equity piece of this. It's a work in progress. We're getting there, Judy. The numbers you went over earlier are, are getting better all the time, but they're not there yet. And Mayor Baraka's initiative is a good example of one area where we're working with Newark uh, to, to pump those numbers um, up. But we, we want to make sure we're presenting this as accurate as, as we can. So we're, we're right now aggressively massaging data. These are not big numbers one way or the other. Uh, but we, we think there are numbers through federal or other programs that we're not counting. And we want to make sure that we're giving you an accurate count of anybody that we're vaccinated in New Jersey who's not a New Jersey resident. Having said that, Judy, the 12 to 15, we have to add that to the, the objective is 4.7 million um, initial, 70% uh, of our adults, and we define adults as 16 and up. So we would add that to that. I don't think we've got a target number for you yet, uh, but we're not going to use that as a, as a way to leg into the, um, into the um, objective. Vax, non-vax, we were having a conversation earlier. Um, th this is, there's a lot riding, I think, on 
the, the six foot CDC guidance, uh, I, I believe in terms of the capacities in, as of the 19th, they're, they're gone because they don't, they, they don't matter because it's, you can only fit so many tables if you've got that basis. So I think we wait and see how that looks. I, I personally don't like the feel of a vaccinated over here, non-vaccinated's over there. Um, I'd like to think we can come up with a, a better um, uh, answer than that. Why hesitancy? I think it's a combination of reasons. Judy, you should weigh in here. I think it's some amount of folks, although this is not the crowd that we, that we ever thought was going to be the nut that we could crack, is there's some amount of anti-vax block of folks for, that we knew from day one. I don't think we've ever thought that's a big enough block that prevents us from getting there. I think it's a combination of some very different things. Um, hey, the numbers are getting better. I haven't been sick. The weather's better. Frankly, I think I can let my hair down. Um, I work hours that are inconsistent with when you're open. It's less that I'm not convenient to a location because we've got so many darn locations. We're within, I think, eight, 90, 99 point something percent of our population is within five miles of a site. So I don't think it's that. Um, I think there is still some amount of knowledge gap. And lastly, the big one, I think, are hard to reach people. Homebound, homeless, dense communities, overwhelmingly in communities of color. Um, I don't think it's any one reason. Do you, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I, I'm not convinced that the bigger issue is hesitancy. I think it's more making sure that it's convenient, making sure they're going to a familiar place where it's safe. Um, you know, the, the, I'm not right there on the hesitancy yet because I, I see the numbers when we get deep into a community and we're in a local church and we have um, local faith leaders and elective leaders, um, uh, you know, calling out to people to get vaccinated. The numbers, uh, uh, particularly the equity numbers, go up substantially. Uh, so I think we have, I have a little bit more time before I say it's hesitancy. I do want to give one message, though. Only 46% of the people getting vaccinated right now are male. Huh. Women are lining up in much greater numbers. Now, we have always said in healthcare that women make the majority of the healthcare decisions for their families, for their loved ones, for their you know, fathers and brothers and husbands and partners. I'm going to say to the women, use, use your power, convince your, your male friends uh, to get vaccinated. And I want to say to the men, nobody is stronger than this virus. No one Amen. is stronger than this virus. Amen. So get moving. Roll up your sleeve. Pat one I, shot. Pat, Pat and I take this personally. <laughs> Amen. That's a great message. And I think that's, a, and, and this is not quibbling with the question, which is a great one, and I'm glad you asked it. I think hesitancy is a, is a word that covers a lot of different things, some of which is hesitancy. Um, I will come back to you if, if the answer is differently, I promise you. I don't think I did any campaign events uh, with this organization. I visited it when I was uh, either running or before I was running. If, if, that's, if it's different than that, I'll come back to you. And again, this is not based on what I know. This is not about the religion or the, the faith side of this. This is clearly a, a horrific, uh, if, assuming if these allegations are proven to be true, horrific administrative um, uh, behavior. Uh, of humans in a, in a way that is unfathomable. Can we come back to you on the 40 million? Because I don't have a crisp answer for you exactly how that, that, that will work. And if you could help me out, Mahan, either to follow up with Alex or hit that when we're back together on Monday. Thank you. You good, sir? Okay. How are you? Afternoon, Governor. Afternoon. I have a variety from uh, NJ Spotlight. Uh, what is your response to the hundreds of thousands of undocumented workers who are still left out of the $40 million fund for excluded workers? They have been calling for $600 a week in unemployment payments. Are you considering that? Uh, and do you plan to give $2,000 checks to more impacted residents with funding for, the, uh, with funding for New Jersey from the American Rescue Plan? Uh, for the commissioner, again on vaccine hesitancy, uh, what demographics does the state need to reach to immunize 4.7 million people? Uh, you shared geographic target areas, but are there certain populations uh, or age groups that you're finding particularly hesitant? Uh, likewise, how is the vaccine outreach going um, for homebound residents? 
Um, when are you planning on making an announcement about reopening public pools? And then finally on non-COVID, uh, in what ways is Atlantic City better off for having had state intervention over the past five years and what remains undone uh, that would necessitate a four-year extension of the takeover? I think that was a change of subject. Um, listen, on the excluded fund, which Alex asked about, and, and we will give folks more detail and, and help me wherever mine has gone to follow up and, with both of these guys on it. Um, you know, my principle continues to be we'll do everything we can. This is federal money that uh, CRF or coronavirus relief funds from, from before. Um, that is a, both a public health and economic health matter. We will not get to where we need to get to unless we all get there. So we want to try to touch as everybody in our state in some way, whether it's vaccinations, whether it's help in some form or fashion, which this program does and we'll continue at that. Uh, this is something that is not just a, you know, you make an announcement and you, you walk away. We're going to do whatever we can. Demographics and homebound folks, Judy, if I'll, I'll defer to you on both of that, although I think you've you hit the big one today for me. 46% of the vaccinated uh, folks are male and that number's got to get up. School announcement, I alluded to this. I don't have a specific um, date for you, but last year we gave guidance in the month of June. My guess is that that's what we will shoot for. I don't want to uh, speak for An An Angelica Allen McMillan, but my, that my gut tells me working with the Department of Health, that feels about right. And remember that we refined it over the course of the summer, because as we always remind folks, we rem remind ourselves the vaccine dictates this, this war, not uh, us. Um, can't hear you. Oh, pools. I think he said schools. Oh. As Roseanne Rosanna Dana would say, never mind. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I apologize. Paramel, please help me out. The Paramel's pool. going to get into his swim, swimming trunks and answer this question. The pool's guidance just went live yesterday. It's on the Department of Health website. Okay. <clears throat> Could have saved, I apologize, it could have saved a few minutes in the press conference. Um, I don't know, the past five years, I was critical of the nature of the relationship between the state government and Atlantic City before we got here. And I'm not patting ourselves on the back because uh, there's still work to be done. But it was a, you know, it was a takeover, in, and that's the way it ran it from the top. It was, you know, bigfooting the community. And I am proud, led by Sheila Oliver, Jim Johnson is no longer in our administration, did a great work early on, that this has been a true partnership. And I think everybody has benefited from that, especially and most importantly, Atlantic City. But I personally think in the spirit of partnership, we can't walk away from each other. And there's a lot of unfinished business, uh, including exciting new uh, uh, economic opportunity, there needs to be a whole lot more help uh, in that partnership from us, I would say, as it relates to getting neighborhoods and getting, this, getting that extraordinary community to punch at its weight, because it is an extraordinary community. I've said this many times, there's a handful of communities. As they go, the state goes, and Atlantic City is on that handful. Uh, and it's a partnership, again, on behalf of Sheila Oliver, uh, and her team, I, uh, I would say, and Mayor Marty Small, on the other hand, and his team, I think it's a, 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 a well-functioning and good working partnership, but one with, which still has a lot of work still to do. Judy, any other co uh, commentary on demographics, particularly where, if you had a magic wand, would like to punch up uh, our vaccine rates, and any update on homebound folks, where I, which I know has been a big push over the past couple of weeks? Um, yeah, let me start with the demographics. You know we continually look at the um, equity statistics. And the Latinas are now, uh, they now account for 13.3% of the vaccines that we've given, which is going up uh, more quickly than the black African American, which uh, is about 6.9% right now. So not representative of our um, of their, of their uh, presence in our population. So we really want to work um, diligently and hard on that. Uh, I have to go back to the men. 46% um, 
um, of the, the uh, vaccines that, that are given or have been given to men, but they account for 54.5% of our deaths. 54.5% of the individuals that have died uh, in New Jersey uh, are men. And only 46% of them have lined up to get uh, vaccinated. So again, I, I call out to that. I think that um, that's the broad demographic. If we get deeper, it's uh, young Hispanic men we need to pay attention to. There are three times more likely to die from COVID than their white counterparts. And African-American, black, male, and females are two times as likely. So our goal in the Department of Health is to prevent morbidity and mortality. And uh, we, we will never forget that mission. Uh, so that they're the demographics we need to go after. How about any comment on homebound? I don't have the numbers on homebound. I can get them, but they're increasing um, with our homebound plan uh, through the local health departments and the VNA. And ARP has um, um, sent us a, a message that they're willing to help, and we will be calling them in. Yeah. Again, Operation Jersey Summer, the homebound piece preceded it, but it's another example. The two phrases, Judy, I've been using, when folks, how would you describe your vaccination energies right now? Offensive, in other words, we're, we're past the day where folks are coming to the vaccine. The vaccine has to go to them. Uh, and that includes certainly homebound people, but more generally. And secondly, localize, getting deeply local with this, which is why we've used the hub and spoke analogy with the mega sites. It's less, the mega sites, although for the 12 to 15 years old, I think we're going to see a bump up on that uh, pretty clearly um, when that goes live. But it's going to be much more the mega site coordinates the, the spoke activities into the communities. With that, Dave, take us home. Thank you, Governor. Um, if the CDC, as expected, does approve the Pfizer vaccine for kids between 12 and 15, Governor, what would your advice be for parents? We heard from the commissioner. Um, why do you think, and I'm assuming you do, that parental conversations with their kids are important? Um, Commissioner, you just mentioned that um, the business about more women getting vaccinated than men, and you said, women, use your power. Please explain what you mean. Uh, despite your explanations about the RT over the last couple of weeks, Governor, some people are actually saying, uh-oh, you know, we may have a problem here, uh, which is kind of odd, but it's true. Could you, in simple terms, as simple as possible, explain what happened? Why did it drop so much? And now it, all of a sudden it came back. Now it seems to finally be sort of leveling off. And are the other COVID, COVID metrics, could you um, remind us, are they telling us good things? Are, they, are we seeing a good trend here? And finally, question from Mike Simons in our State House Bureau. The State Department of Health's COVID dashboard shows that more than 250 doses of the J&J &J vaccine were administered in New Jersey during the 11-day period when it had been halted. Where did that happen, and were there any repercussions for that? Thank you. Thank you. Judy, I'll start, and please come on, and, and Tina, uh, jump in. I'm going to deliberately try to answer the RT question because I think, and then you all will correct it, because I think what you're looking for is a non-medical, non-scientific, just sort of common sense. And that's not to say that these, the two women on my right are as good as, as there is anywhere to explain complex stuff, but I'm going to give it a shot. My advice to the parents of the 12 to 15-year-olds, that's a little bit younger than our four, but I will tell you, if they had been in that range, it would have been saying, listen, this is safe, it's smart, it'll keep you healthy, and it'll allow you to do a lot more stuff. Um, so go out and get it. Um, and again, this is Pfizer. Judy, I'm not, have you heard any word on other of the manufacturers? It's too early. They're all doing trials, but it's too early on kids. So my gut tells me it'll be Pfizer for a while. Moderna, maybe. Moderna, you know, maybe. I don't, I don't, I don't want to predict as to when, but um, I just say, listen, go get them. It's safe. It's easy, doesn't hurt, uh, very few side effects. And again, most importantly, I think in a kid's mind that age, you could do a lot more stuff in life. Um, I'm going to use, the, uh, defer to Judy in a second on the you, use your own 
power. I don't have any insight on the 250 J and J's during that window. I'll ask Judy or Tina if they do, but my guess is we'll probably want to get back to you on that. Would be my guess. Yeah, so the, the, the RT is, encompasses a seven day look back. And we had a couple of days, depending on when you were looking at this number, where we either caught up and added cases in a particular day that had been a catch up, or another day where we took cases down and adjusted the number down. And just because of the nature of the, of the statistic itself, when you have a big bump up on one of those days or a bump down, it skews the number and it, it skews the curve of how it moves from one day to the next. Um, you saw it pop up over, I think it was 107 yesterday, if I'm not mistaken. 107 yesterday down to one. I was putting words in Judy's mouth or Tina's. It, 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 I think they think it's going to sort of settle without any data anomalies, either up or down into the 0 0.6, 0 0.8 range. And, and it's below one, and that's the key thing. Meaning, again, folks, if we haven't said this in a while, if it's below one, less than one person is getting inf infected uh, for every person that is. Other health metrics, how do we feel about them? I, I defer all of this to you all. I think we feel really good right now. Uh, even weekend positivity has got a four handle on it. That was consistently, not three or four weeks ago, 11, 12, 13% on weekends. It's down by two thirds, if not three quarters. Hospitalizations are down. ICU vents down. Um, as we said earlier, Tina's good answer, the children's inflammatory syndrome, consistent with generally good numbers, <clears throat> is flat, uh, uh, and therefore, as a result, down. And I, I assume you'd say that we, we're watching the variants. We have the Indian variant, which is a, there's some wild cards still out there. And the vaccine rollout and the numbers keep going up by the day. We want them to go up faster. But Tina or Judy, Judy, you've got to come in. Women use your power. What's, what's that mean? And any, any corrections you want to make on either my RT explanation or any color on the J&J &J or other metrics or on any color on the J&J doses that, that look like they may have been administered in that window? Yeah, I'll talk about the J&J &J first. Um, the, we immediately instructed all of the points of dispensing to take J&J &J off the shelf. Uh, and uh, to uh, label them appropriately that they c should not be given. So um, I would have to get more information uh, to uh, the best of our knowledge. J&J &J was not given during the 11-day the pause. Um, on women's power, historically, women uh, have been known to make most of the medical decisions, f again, for their families, their loved ones, whether it's making appointments, um, encouraging people to get screenings, using their knowledge and their uh, power of persuasion and encouragement um, has gone a long way historically uh, to meet certain screening criteria, for instance, and we expect that that power is still endorsed today. Any color, Tina, on RT uh, or other metrics that you're looking at? You, I assume you generally feel good about where the numbers are headed? So our communicable disease service, um, you know, puts out a weekly CALI report. That's the COVID activity uh, level index. And we look at, again, those three metrics that we look at are um, cases per 100,000 percent positivity and um, uh, COVID-like illness syndromic surveillance at um, healthcare facilities. And, you know, for the last uh, week, you know, we've seen a decrease in the CALI um, activities. And we remain cautiously optimistic that um, these trends will continue because, you know, we're solidly with within the moderate um, activity range, you know, when you look at those three particular metrics. And um, we like monitoring them over time because, um, you know, for us, at least in the Communicable Disease Service, um, you know, the Cali report, you know, is, is based on, you know, looking at the historical data, um, you know, over time, you know, as well. That's how we came up with, like, the different cutoffs that we did. So, um, you know, we continue to monitor that. You know, we might, um, you know, potentially tweak some of those um, uh, uh, thresholds in the future. But, you know, the good news is that our weekly Cali reports are trending the right way. Amen. Thank you all. Uh, Judy, Pat just leaned over and said he and his wife, Linda, are celebrating their 31st anniversary tomorrow. So happy anniversary to you. And the reason is he listens and does what he's told to do by Linda. So um, he's taken your advice, including you got vaccinated. So uh, with that, we'll mask up here.
Judy, I'm going to a single mask on Friday because it'll be two weeks after my second dose. So I think you'd, you and Tina will allow me to do that because I'll be fully vaccinated. And we're going to go, uh, we're going to, unless we're in a pack, we're, we're doing a 5K in a few weeks together. So I may, it may be different then. Unless we're in a pack, we're going we're, we're to have the monos, but not wear them while we're running because Tammy and I are in the same bubble, same household. So I want to make sure I have your blessing on that front. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Judy and Tina. Pat, thank you. Happy anniversary. Paramel, I know Jared was with us by remote today. Mahan, everybody else, thank you, folks. Keep doing what you're doing um, because you're doing an extraordinary job. Please get vaccinated. If you've been vaccinated, thank you. But then please think of somebody in your family, a friend, a neighbor, a coworker, and remind them for their own personal health. Forget even for a minute public health. It's also true for that. For their own personal health, they are taking far more risk by not getting vaccinated than if they do. It's a disproportionate risk. Uh, the, the risks associated with this vaccine are very, very minimal. Uh, the risks associated with getting COVID are not. So that's my one message. God bless you all. Thank you.